it's a question of how uh, supernovae explode. Uh, there are two possible energy sources for um, an explosion. It could either be a central engine, uh, just like the black hole that somehow releases uh, energy into its vicinity and powers it. That's how a gamma ray burst uh, takes place. Or it could be a radioactive material that is produced in the supernova that is powering uh, the light curve of the supernova. And so understanding the, um, the way that supernovae explode and, and which fraction of them end up as black holes and which fraction end up as neutron stars is very important for our theoretical understanding of these uh, important events. Uh, theories for many years had a difficult time exploding uh, massive stars on the computer. And it's quite possible that uh, they were right, that in fact uh, a, a fraction of those explosive events end up eventually imploding and making a black hole. We don't know the relative uh, statistics of black holes and neutron stars to a very good uh, precision at the moment. And so observing events like that are very important in terms of calibrating uh, the statistics. Uh, in addition, um, black hole and neutron star binaries are important sources of gravitational waves. And there are observatories being constructed to detect these waves. And so we would like, of course, to know the abundance of black holes and neutron stars. And overall, uh, we're dealing with the properties of matter at extreme conditions, at very high densities, close to that of an atomic nucleus. Um, and we cannot really reproduce these conditions in the laboratory. And so by observing the sky, we're able to learn about environments that cannot be reproduced in the lab and that can only be observed out there in the universe. Uh, of course, uh, if we go back in time to the very first stars, for example, the conditions there were different. It's quite possible, as some theorists uh, argue, that massive stars were much more uh, abundant at early times, and so the formation of black holes may have been uh, much more frequent at early cosmic times. And I will turn the, the stage to Kim. Thanks, Avi. Thanks, Dan, for explaining this exciting result. Um, what is it that really matters in terms of this result? It's not just that possibly we have found the youngest nearby black hole. It is a young black hole, but what's really exciting about it is that we know the exact birth date of the black hole. We have found for the first time possibly the true birth date of a black hole. And you may ask, well, aren't black holes in the early universe younger, perhaps, than this one? Certainly, there are black holes that are forming um, all the time. And in the early universe, there might be very young black holes. But do we know their exact age? Do we know exactly how old they are? No, it's very difficult to do that. Um, when light has traveled billions and billions of years to reach us, it's hard to say exactly when a black hole that we're looking at was born. So this is a very important result to be able to pinpoint the birth date of a black hole for the first time. And for me, in terms of studying black holes, what's exciting about it is that we know it's very young. It is in its infancy if it is a black hole. And we want to watch how this system evolves and changes in its youthful stages from when it's first born to when it goes into a child and a teenager and gets older and accretes more material because that's how we understand the physics of black hole systems. Um, so that's very important. The other thing that's kind of neat about this story is it is a story. It's a story of science in action. And um, you, you know you've heard a little bit about the, the, the description of the observations, when it was observed. It was observed many times since with uh, NASA satellites and other uh, ob ob observatories. And so astronomers around the globe have taken images and, and data from this object and over time have put together this story which is sort of like a detective story, taking pieces of the puzzle and putting them together and finally determining that, yes, indeed, we've almost solved the puzzle now. We just need a few more pieces, so we're very close to understanding the true uh, source, the, the genesis of this, this compact object in the center of this supernova explosion. So that's very exciting. Um, it's in its infancy. We want to understand accretion and energy production in this object. The thing that's interesting about supernova 1979C is that it's very difficult to see these objects, even if there were many of them out there in our galaxy, for example. When a supernova goes off, it, it 
f fills its, its uh, region with material, and so it might be difficult to look inside and see through the obscuration to see the black hole being formed. Also, the light, the integrated light from that supernova event might be too bright and might get in the way of seeing the light from the black hole accretion anyway. So it probably takes about four to five years before you can really see the X-ray light coming out of the material around the black hole. That makes this object actually perfect for detecting because it's roughly the right age to be able to see that X-ray signature pop out. So it's a wonderful opportunity for astronomers to look at these young systems, and I hope we can find many, many more of them. And now that we know a way to do that by using X-ray data, hopefully astronomers will begin to look through the data and see if we can find more. Um, so what is the implication for finding more baby black holes in the universe? Again, this is the first direct evidence for one, the first strong direct evidence. Um, so to me, it's sort of a new population of youthful objects. You know, I'd like to be able to see more young black holes because I want to understand what's happening right after they're born. And they probably are very common. Another important tool here is the X-ray spectrum itself. We see what we believe to be a, the X-ray spectrum of accretion around a black hole. There are many objects out there that are compact that we think might be black holes, but we're not sure. And the only data we have are X-ray spectra. So if we really know that this is one, then we can take this spectrum and match it to the other X-ray spectra and see if they look the same. And if they do, that's a very good indirect way to say, oh, these other things are also black holes. So I think that this discovery is going to help astronomers add to our census of the number of black holes that we know about in the universe. And I'll turn it over to Alex. And said, this is an exciting discovery. A very young black hole, born just 31 years ago, as seen by us. So here we have essentially a baby picture of a stellar mass black hole, one that is about five times the mass of the sun. Those are the stellar mass ones, as opposed to the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. Now, we know of several dozen stellar mass black holes in our Milky Way galaxy, and there are probably millions of them in each big galaxy, but we don't know their ages. Most of them are probably millions or even billions of years old. So here is one whose age we actually know, and by continuing to observe this object, we will be able to study how young black holes behave, and especially how they swallow gas from their immediate surroundings, how they accrete this gas. Now, as Avi said, it's important to distinguish supernova 1979C from another way of producing stellar mass black holes, the so-called gamma ray bursts, or GRBs. Now, gamma ray bursts are sometimes called the birth cries of black holes, and it's true, we, we do indeed think that many of them produce stellar mass black holes but we still don't have any direct evidence that they produce black holes. We have not yet detected the putative black holes in these objects. Gamma ray bursts produce black holes through the merging of two neutron stars or through the collapse of a single extremely massive rotating star. But such events are extremely rare. Supernova 1979C, on the other hand, may be more, a more typical way in which massive stars produce black holes. Now, another interesting difference is that GRBs generally occur billions of light years away and billions of years ago, whereas supernova 1979C occurred in the relatively nearby beautiful galaxy M100 in the Virgo cluster, only about 50 million light years away. So in a sense, this object is almost in our backyard compared with typical GRBs. We'll be able to study it in much more detail. We'll be able to study this accretion process. As Avi mentioned, supernova 1979C was a relatively rare type of supernova, a so-called type II linear. These kinds of exploding stars are only about 5 or 6 percent of core collapse supernovae, and moreover, only a small fraction of them probably produce black holes at their center. The others produce a very dense type of star known as a neutron star. But astronomers don't yet know what the dividing line in mass is between the types of stars that produce neutron stars versus those that produce black holes. We just don't know what that dividing line is, but it's important because we want to understand how exactly black holes are produced. 
The star that formed supernova 79C probably had an initial mass of about 20 solar masses, and this might be very close to this dividing line in mass. Now, there are certainly other variables, such as how mass is lost from the star prior to the explosion, and whether the star is in a binary stellar system. Supernova 1979C, in fact, may have been in a binary stellar system. But in any case, the supernova will help astronomers determine which stellar explosions make black holes and which ones make neutron stars. And this will also tell us about the nature of matter at very high densities, and we can't study that in terrestrial laboratories. You know, you can't go to the hardware store and, and buy a neutron star. Whereas here we have a case that may be telling us the dividing line at which point a ball of matter becomes unstable and gravitationally collapses to form a black hole. The final possibility I want to mention is that as Dan said, this might be powered by a pulsar wind nebula, not necessarily by accretion onto a black hole. But to me, that would also be interesting, because this would be the youngest known pulsar wind nebula. Now, a great example of such an object is the Crab Nebula, which is nearly a thousand years old. It was the rem it's the remnant of the supernova that was studied by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054. And it's been studied by astronomers in great detail. What we see in supernova 1979C may be a very young version of the Crab Nebula, and it will help us understand the evolution of such objects through time. So I'm pretty excited about this discovery, regardless of whether it turns out to be a young black hole or a pulsar wind nebula. We should keep on observing it to learn more about it. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, now we're going to move on to the question and answer session. Uh, for all participants, please identify yourself and your media affiliation before asking your question. Uh, and if possible, direct your question to a specific panelist. Uh, for those joining by phone, uh, you can signal the operator that you have a question by pushing the star one keys on your telephone. Um, and we have a number of press online with us, so I'd ask you to please limit yourself to one question to start. Um, I understand that we have a question on the phone from Seth Bornstein from the Associated Press. Seth, go ahead. Thank you so much for doing this. I guess this would be for Avi or, or, or Kimberly.